childbirth is brief, but the experience affects us deeply and in long-lasting ways. In the media, we often see stories of life-saving heroics or the tragic misjudgments of isolated individuals. But my research tells a very different story. My book, Birthing Work, is about a research project that was conducted with the help of my colleague, Kelly Dombrowski. We interviewed mothers, midwives, and obstetricians in Australia and New Zealand. We asked them about their experiences of birth and what happens in the birth space. What came through most clearly is that no one thing shapes that experience. There isn't one right way to have a baby, and no single person in that space is solely in charge of what happens. The experience of childbirth is determined by everyone and everything that gathers around a woman in labour. It's a collective effort. Childbirth is brief, but there is a lot to learn from this one moment. From the beginning, the experience of pregnancy has the potential to teach us how interdependence is central to life. My own wake-up call came early in my first pregnancy. I was honeymooning on the back of a motorcycle. I was three weeks pregnant and completely unprepared. At the beginning, it was really the shock of losing control that got to me. My body was no longer my own. And this was a surprise after spending much of my adult life feeling like I was in charge, pushing my body to do what I wanted it to do. Now, suddenly, and quite unexpectedly, my body commanded me to stop, to rest, to eat, to sleep right now. And if I didn't, I'd soon be falling off the back of the bike. It was pretty clear that I was no longer in charge. My well-being suddenly depended on the needs and rhythms of my unborn child, who was at that time just a minuscule collection of cells. At the same time, I had to suddenly make a series of changes to how I lived my life. My body demanded frequent food and rest, and the leaflets I was given by my midwife informed me that I should be very careful about what I ate. Soft cheeses, pre-prepared deli foods, runny egg yolk, salami were all off the menu. And suddenly I found myself eating salt and vinegar chips in bed at 5am to keep away morning sickness. I couldn't stand to drink coffee anymore and wine was forbidden. I didn't feel particularly in control of myself or my body, but I did carry all the responsibility. The leaflets made me feel like if I did the wrong thing, my child would be harmed and it would be all my fault. Many of the women we spoke to felt the same way. Most maternity care systems focus on the choices made by the mother. She's very often regarded as a rational individual who ought to be able to make the right decisions about her pregnancy. From the very earliest stages of pregnancy, experience teaches us something different. Becoming a mother involves entering into a co-production of a shared existence, a co-becoming. It begins in the body, as a fetus and a mother begin to collaborate on growing a new life. This is the work of cells and biochemistry, of blood and muscle and bone. The experience of pregnancy is also shaped by the families that we are in, by the belief systems we hold, the cultures we are from, and different bodies get treated differently. It shouldn't be the case, but skin colour and ethnicity have an impact on what kind of care a woman receives. By the time a woman is in a room delivering her baby, she is at the centre of a whole gathering. There's everything that's going on in her body and her baby's body, but there are also the other people in the room, family members, midwives, obstetricians, medical students, anaesthetists, each of those people brings in different stuff, different knowledge, different expectations, and different biases. And looming over the shoulders of all the medical staff are things like hospital policies, insurance policies, drug companies, managers, actuaries. It goes on. Emotions and sensations also loom large. Lots of people are nervous. Lots of people are excited. Sometimes people are fearful and anxious. The woman is almost always in pain. Sometimes it's good pain, other times it's not. 
Then there's the furniture, the bright lights, the equipment. There's a bed that calls you to lie down on it. Even though all the research tells us childbirth will go more smoothly if a woman is up and moving around. Somewhere there's a clock ticking and somewhere someone might be pouring a bath. The whole is a messy and complicated picture and nothing in it is entirely neutral. My claim is that all these things, the people, the bodies, the bed, are all contributing actively to the experience of childbirth. They're not just neutral observers of the birth process. They are active agents. They do work. And in fact, they do work together. All the human and non-human actors present in childbirth are our inevitable companions. And together, they have a collective effect on what unfolds. The question is, how do we harness that collective to make sure each and every child has a good beginning in life? How do we harness that collective so that each woman has a good start to motherhood? The answers are not the same for everybody. And this is especially true for women from different cultural class backgrounds, women in different parts of the world, LGBTQ women, women with different religious or spiritual beliefs, women who are rich and women who are poor. There's no one right way to have a baby, but our maternity care systems often function as if there is. What gets forgotten is that there is a whole range of actors shaping birth. What we can think about is how to bring these actors together into a team. How do we get that collective to work together to support a positive, even an empowering experience of birth? In the book, I highlight eight of the things that are almost always present in childbirth. And the stories I share show how these eight companions have the potential to shape beautiful birth experiences. First, there is the collective as a whole. I talk about this as an assemblage. The assembled parts are never exactly the same. What each actor does or how it interacts with another can be managed but never controlled. And within the assemblage is the mother and her baby. One thing that was clear from our interviews was that women were forming relationships with their babies from the very beginning of pregnancy. And the baby is also doing her own thing, turning this way, putting a foot here and an elbow there, perhaps pushing herself out, perhaps refusing to move. A live baby is not just an outcome of birth, but an active participant. There are bodies at work in childbirth, and not all bodies are the same. A body might do the work of labour well, or it might go on strike. A body might give birth beautifully, no matter the environment, or it might be a body that needs careful coaxing and gentle touch. It might be a fearful body, or a body that feels safe. Then there are the things in the room. The inert stuff in the birth space is never just stuff. Beds, lights, stools, showers, bathtubs, these things shape what is possible in the room. But objects can be moved and spaces reshaped. Lights can be dimmed, clocks can be covered up, and hospital beds can be wheeled into the corridor. There are always institutions present. Bureaucracies, laws, policies, regulations are unavoidable, and they tend to focus on fixed parameters and strict hierarchies that aren't always helpful for an individual woman's labour. But institutions are also made up of intelligent, creative and empathetic human beings, many of whom care deeply about the women they are caring for. There are also technologies that can save lives, but sometimes also make labour more difficult. There might be a CTG machine in the corner for monitoring the baby's heart rate. The machine can inform and reassure at the same time as it prompts anxiety or becomes a tool for abuse. If it's used well, a CTG can be an ally. Used badly, it can cause harm. And this goes for all the tools and technologies that carers might use. Time is always important, especially when things happen too slowly or too late. 
Time might seem like a neutral way to mark an unfolding event, but it's not. Clock time lends itself to a standardised measurement of progress. But labour time is a different thing. It follows the cadence of the body's contractions. Many stories highlighted the way that time can be on our side, especially if the anxieties of the ticking clock are held at bay and there's space given for labour to unfold safely in its own time. Finally, there is love. Love is not always the dominant emotion in the birth space, although it could be and should be. Oxytocin is a hormone crucial to labour, and it is also the chemical imprint of love and of feelings of safety, trust, empathy and connection. In other words, there can be no labour without love. If a life begins in birth, so too do our human relationships. Seeking to begin these in love ought to be simple common sense. Bodies, things, institutions, technologies, time, love, and a baby. These are some of our companions in birth. And like companions in life, they don't always work peacefully together. But these companions are always doing work in the birth space. They are there collectively shaping the experience. How do we gather this collective in a productive way? How do we compile a team that will shape positive and empowering birth experiences for all kinds of different women? A starting point is to put love at the centre and to start taking collective responsibility for making sure it stays there.